This next speaker spoke at the conference in 2018. And at the time, he said that he would learn Italian for his girlfriend. Well, it is now three years later, and he's completed the Italian class on Duolingo and has an 830-day streak. I hope this conference doesn't ruin the streak. You got to keep that going. Everyone, please welcome Adam. The opportunities that we have to make mental health care a lot more effective. Um, one thing that we do at Spring that, that I really love and that I'm going to continue even for external things is uh, I like to share a, a testimonial from members um, because I think that kind of, um, you know, every day you wake up and, you, you know, you roll out of bed and you roll onto your laptop and you have to um, get pumped up for the day. And I think that this is something that really helps me, you know, stay motivated and stay driven with work. And so I want to uh, kind of uh, share that um, with everyone else. So. Uh, this quote came in from a, a person who works at General Mills, which is one of our customers. And he said, I hit a point in December where I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. I had restless nights due to extreme anxiety and I was not myself at work or at home. I'm reaching out for a lifeline today during my first discussion with a care navigator uh, to help to get help and to find myself again for both my family, my work and me. My care navigator made me feel like I wasn't starting this journey alone and that therapy was going to help. Taking no action wasn't an option anymore. And I'm so grateful for the ease and support that Spring Health is providing so that I can find my best self again. Um, I, I like to take a moment just to, um, to put a voice to some of the numbers that, that we talk about. So Spring is a company uh, I founded about uh, six, almost six years ago, five and a half years ago now. Uh, we're based in New York. We have about 250 employees now going on 400 by the end of the year. Uh, and we help individuals and organizations thrive by eliminating every barrier to mental health. Uh, the company's uh, grown quite considerably. We've raised over $100 million. Uh, we serve about 2 million patients uh, right now and, and soon to be 11 million patients. Uh, and large employers uh, around the world, but particularly in the U.S., uh, basically pay us to, to help um, uh, help them deliver a mental health benefit. So if you work at places like Whole Foods, Instacart, General Mills, Pfizer, Gap, uh, you know, Pepsi, um, Adobe, uh, all, all of those kind of uh, companies, they've now like adopted this model where uh, they entrust a company like Spring uh, to help deliver and administer all of the mental health uh, benefits that their employees and their family members can get access to. Uh, and those companies pay us uh, primarily because mental health care uh, in 2021 still and in the United States uh, it is uh, a pretty frustrating uh, and broken experience. Uh, in general, it starts too late. Uh, people, you know, they feel bad. They're not sure why. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, there's a lot of stigma. Uh, they, you know, they may not know, they may not have the right vocabulary to know what they're going through, but they know that they're not feeling the way that they used to feel. You know, hopefully uh, they do seek treatment and, uh, you know, by extraordinary fortune, some of them actually get in front of a provider. They see the provider, they get diagnosed, you know, they tell them, you know, all the problems that, that they've been facing uh, and about 30% of those people drop out at that point, never to be seen again. 70% of them do, they go, they see that provider, the provider gives them a treatment, something like uh, medications, like uh, SSRIs or, or maybe therapy, talk therapy, different kinds of therapy. Um, and, and about 30% of them will actually recover. So 70% of them don't recover. You know, they go back to the doctor, the doctor says, okay, well, let's try something else. Let's try, you know, therapy this time, or let's try meds, or let's try a different med. Uh, and this time they have a 25% chance of getting better. You know, they, they go away for three or four months, they try that treatment again, they come back and it didn't work again. And now there's only a 20% chance that they get better. Over this whole, you know, trial and error process, eventually the majority of people do, do get better somehow, um, uh, although the process is really uncomfortable for them. But then we know that statistically a, a, a year later, about 40% of them will have relapsed. And so they, they end up sick again. And so this whole, this whole process of, of trying to get access to care, uh, of trying to find the right care for you, of trying to find a treatment that's going to work well for you, uh, it, it is really, really frustrating in the US. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really here, what we're here to try and solve for, for, for customers and for members uh, throughout the world. You know, it's not a pretty picture, uh, but it is worth noting that things have been getting better, right? It was only 80 years ago when we still had asylums and, and kind of the primary treatment for mental health conditions uh, involved physical restraint. 
Uh, it was about 30, 50 years ago when we had the invention of antidepressants or the discovery of antidepressants, uh, when we developed a lot of the, the kind of the core techniques that we use now in talk therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy. Uh, and, and today we're in this situation where, you know, treatments work on average, right? We know that medications do work when you go and put them through a clinical trial, or we know that therapy does kind of work uh, and, and people do statistically get better on average, uh, but there's still so much trial and error, right? People go in, they try a med, they have side effects, they come back or doesn't work and they try therapy and they don't like the therapist or they try a different kind of therapy and then that eventually works and and so it, it does work but it's really clunky and there's this whole um you know there's this huge phenomenon of trial and error which delays you know successful recovery and also increases costs because it's prolonging the cost of treatment uh, and so you know ultimately at spring i think we have this vision that we can do a lot more and i think that mental health care in the future will be a lot more proactive i think it will be a lot more predictive and i hope that it will be a lot more effective and i think that we can do all of these things uh, using technologies like our um you know uh, using tools from statistics and data science and so Today, I'm gonna to go over three examples where R and data science are improving mental health. Uh, all of these things are live today. Uh, these are all examples that you know that you could contribute to if, if you were really interested, but just wanted to pick three different examples. Uh, the first one is around this concept of personalizing treatment, um, talking about uh, you know statistical tools and frameworks that we've developed that can help us understand what treatment is most likely to work for you specifically, rather than you know proving that a treatment works uh, on average. A second is technology that we've developed uh, to really enrich the treatment process, to, to really try and get at this question of what is our vital sign in mental health? If you have diabetes, we know that we track the amount of sugar in your blood and, and we kind of follow that during treatment and we maybe change the treatment to try and, uh, you know, either raise your blood sugar level or lower your blood sugar level and try and keep it in the right bounds. And, and we kind of know what good looks like and we know what bad looks like. Uh, we don't really have that in mental health. And so, you know, a lot of the work that we do is, is really around tracking out outcomes and trying to come up with this vital sign and, and really determining whether treatment is actually working for people. Uh, and then the third, I wanna share some new stuff that we've been doing over the last few years uh, around pay for performance. So once we have this vital sign and we've figured out, you know, who's having a good outcome, who's having a bad outcome, uh, can we actually, um, can we actually pay providers, figure out who, which providers are doing the best job uh, and pay them more? Uh, and then the people who are not doing you know, the best job, can we train them and help them do a better job in the future? And so that's all work um, that, I'll, that I'll share that has been developed by, um, by people at Spring in the last couple of years. So we'll start out with this, uh, this concept of personalizing treatment. Uh, if you're really interested, you can go and check out a paper that we published in The Lancet back in 2016. Uh, there's a little screenshot in the top right. Um, Clinicians have so many treatment options. If you show up to a doctor, say you go and see a psychiatrist, a super well-trained psychiatrist, they have so many different things that they can do. There are dozens of different medications that have all been approved by the FDA. There are dozens of different uh, you know, th psychotherapies or talk therapies that they can use. Some of them are very solutions focused. Some of them you might talk a lot about your feelings. Some of them you might talk a lot about your relationships. So there are all of these different styles that can go into it. Uh, but that clinician doesn't really know what's gonna work for you. And so often they'll say things like, let's start with Lexapro or let's start with therapy. And, they, and then they see if that works out. Um, you know, it, it, the, the kind of the core concept behind this paper was to try and see if we could use information that we could, that we could get from patients before they go into treatment and, and see if we could predict whether they would respond to specific treatments and maybe give that information to doctors before they decide on a treatment and hopefully help them uh, make better decisions about that. And so what we did was we went and took uh, existing data from many, many clinical trials. Uh, we trained a gradient boosting machine. We used XGBoost and Carrot. Carrot's an awesome library. Uh, please do check it out if you haven't already used it. Um, uh, and we use that to basically try and predict using pre-treatment pre information, uh, whether someone would respond to a specific treatment in the future. Uh, you, you can then productionize it, you, you know, wrap the model in, in some kind of API or some kind of binary uh, and, and implement it in production. Uh, and then we found that two people who did take a treatment that was recommended to them, a treatment that was predicted to work, are actually two times more likely to recover with that treatment than if uh, you know, they'd taken a treatment that was selected by the psychiatrist based on clinical intuition. Uh, and so there's this, you know, uh, even when someone gets access to care, there is this clear opportunity for us to make smarter decisions, to make, um, to make better use of the treatments that are available to us uh, already. A second example that I want to talk about is really on the operational side. Um, again, touching on this concept of a vital sign in mental health and tracking outcomes. So uh, if you're really interested in this one, I suggest another Lancet paper. This one was not done by Spring. It was done by uh, one of our advisors called Jamie Delgadillo based in the UK. Uh, in the UK, they, they deliver psychological services through a program called IAPT, which is basically a government-backed program uh, that standardizes the way that they deliver mental health care. Uh, and one of the amazing things that they do is every time you go in for a session, uh, before that session starts, you take a short questionnaire to basically try and um, 
measure, you know, how many symptoms you have, whether, you, whether your symptoms are good, whether your symptoms are bad. Uh, and then on the back end, they can structure and, and analyze all of that data and use it to set clearer expectations for the provider and for the patient about treatment, about treatment outcomes, about whether things are going well, about things are not going well. Uh, they use a couple of our packages, LME4 and NLME, uh, to do growth curve modeling on, on this data. They take nationally representative data. They can say, look, when people come in on average, they have a, you know, a, a depression score of 20, uh, you know, on the second one, it's gone down a little bit. On the third one, it's gone down a little bit. And you can kind of model out that growth curve. Uh, and then they can say, like, let's look at the, you know, the deciles here. What is the trajectory of the worst 10% of outcomes? And what is the trajectory of the best 10% of outcomes? Let's say, okay, this gives us a, the kind of the bounds of, of what we know is normal. If anyone's in that worst 10% of outcomes at any time, let's tell the clinician. Let's, let's tell the clinician and let's ask them to do something about it. Let's have that conversation with the, with the patient. Say, hey, you know, usually by now people have seen this much progress and it seems like we're only seeing this much progress. You know, is it that you don't like the therapist? Is it that you want to try a different style? Is it that something has happened in your life that's made your symptoms worse? But, you know, to, to kind of accelerate that conversation and, and give the, the provider and the patient an opportunity to course correct their treatment much sooner. And when this approach was tested in clinical trials, you can see on the right hand side, these are two um, uh, two KM curves. Uh, and basically, you see that the curve for the green line goes down much steeper than the curve for the orange line, uh, which basically tells you that the, the treatment has a two times lower failure rate. People are much less likely overall to fail treatment or to not recover with treatment uh, if you don't do this. And so essentially, it's another opportunity where you can use data. You can use uh, you know uh, things like data science and things like R. Uh, to, to do informative analyses that really enrich that, that patient and provider relationship that have really important impacts uh, on treatment outcomes overall. And the third example, third and final example that I wanna uh, uh, go a little bit deeper on uh, is this issue of pay for performance. Um, uh, and so uh, for context, in most of healthcare, providers get paid fee for service. Uh, and that means that you know if you go and see your doctor every week, uh, you, you know, you pay them whatever, 100 bucks a week every time you go and see them. And what it means is really if you stay in treatment for longer, providers make more money. Uh, and in mental health, we don't even really measure or demonstrate quality. There's no real concept for quality, uh, certainly not in a kind of regular care or treatment as usual. And so what it means is that providers are really not incentivized to help you get better faster. Because actually, if, you know, if you leave, you know, if you get better and then you leave, um, they now need to go and find a new patient or they're kind of losing revenue. And so you have this like hugely misaligned incentive, that problem of hugely misaligned incentives. Uh, and really in an ideal world, what we would like is for providers to help patients get better as fast as possible. And the providers who can help patients get better fastest should get paid more because that means they're doing a better job, right? So kind of introducing this concept of, uh, of quality and also uh, trying to move away from a pure fee for service model uh, where incentives are maybe not necessarily aligned between the payer and the provider and the patient. And so the work that I'm going to talk about uh, is from three people uh, who all worked at Spring. Um, the first one is Sahar, who's a research scientist at Spring. She drove most of this work, and so all of the credit should go to her. Uh, Kayla Medeiros used to work at Spring, and they did an awesome job uh, prototyping this out. They've done it in the past in uh, different areas of healthcare, and now they've moved on to another area of healthcare, uh, working on weight loss. Uh, and Kelsey Quick is a senior director of provider ops at Spring. Uh, and so... Um, really brought a ton of domain knowledge about how can we communicate this information to providers and how do we kind of um, develop the technology more thoughtfully and like kind of hand in hand with providers rather than this being like a punitive pay for performance scheme. Uh, and so basically there's four kind of components to the, to the program. The first is that they developed this software called Candela. Uh, Candela basically goes and pulls from all of the different systems that we have in the background, uh, things like the scheduling tool, things like the electronic health record, uh, things like patient satisfaction, all those kind of things, and it, and it kind of develops 12 key KPIs around care. So clinical and operational metrics that, that we can agree on with the provider are important, right? So for example, what is the wait time? The wait time should be lower. Uh, what, is the, what is your average, what percentage of your patients actually improve when they go into treatment? Okay, we all agree that that number should, you know, higher is better. And so we kind of go through, uh, you know, these 12 different KPIs, and we all are on the same page. Look, these KPIs are really important, and, and we're clearly agreed on what the targets are for each of those KPIs. Once we track all of that, we then go and report all of this information back to the provider every month. So providers who historically have never had any information uh, about the care that they deliver, kind of flying blind, um, you know, generally lacking, lacking clear feedback, um, now receive a monthly report that tells them, here's how you performed on all of these different performance. You know, last month you treated this many patients and this is how many of them have made 
progress and this is how many of them, you know, said that you're a 10 out of 10 and they're really happy and they have a, a great therapeutic alliance with you. Uh, and then we benchmark all of those data points against all of the rest of the network. So Spring has thousands of providers. And so we'll not just give you your data, but we help you understand the context. So, you know, uh, maybe your wait time is two days and everyone else's wait time is three days. And so therefore, you know, your wait time is good. The third part is once they've once they've kind of burned in and they've started to receive this uh, this feedback so they know where they stand, they start to become eligible for this bonus program. And so we say, hey, look, this is where you're at right now. In four months, we're going to be paying bonuses based on these metrics. So if you you know do really well on these metrics and you're in the top 10 percent or the top 20 percent, you're going to start getting paid a lot more. And if you're in the bottom 20 percent, you know we should do something about that. And so every quarter they get these cash bonuses to the to the highest providing highest performing providers. Um, and so, you know, that in itself is obviously um, uh, motivating for many of the providers. Uh, and then the fourth piece, which I think in, in many ways is even more important, is that we coach the providers. We don't just give them the data in isolation, uh, but the providers receive ongoing actionable feedback on the ways that they can improve the care that they're delivering. And this overall will raise the bar for the, for the provider network. And certainly that was the hope. Um, so it's not just about trying to kind of find the best providers and pay them the most and kind of make the super elitist network. It's also about, you know, what are the ways that we can coach and kind of raise the bar of the network overall by giving people structured feedback and coaching them to, to improve over time. I think it's working for two reasons. Uh, the, the first one is that it really validates and retain, helps us retain the top providers. And so, you know, there's uh, every quarter they get these medals depending on how well they do based on the benchmarks in the network. And, and they're really proud because, you know, they're getting data and um, being told that they're really good at their job for really specific reasons. And so we get all of these LinkedIn posts where people are really happy about it. People send us emails saying thanks and they're really interested in it. Uh, and then the final thing is that it, it is actually raising the bar. And so when we go and look at um, as providers roll into this program and they start receiving that feedback, we then continue to track all of the metrics over time. And you see this clear effect where obviously, you know, the best providers, I think the best providers, are, you know, they know what they're doing already. And so uh, for the top quartile of providers, the results are pretty flat, suggesting that there's maybe not too much room for them to continue to improve when they're already doing a good job. But for all other quartiles, if you look at in each of those different samples, you see a continued improvement. So as the providers start to have eyes on some of these metrics, like this is what my remission score is, this is what my improvement is, this is how long it usually takes me to help the patient recover, uh, you see sustained improvement month over month. And so we're really showing that we can raise the bar and help train these providers to be better at their job uh, and help, help them deliver better, um, better results over time. Almost all of that was built in R as well, which is pretty wild. Uh, on the left-hand side, you could just see like a little example of, of some of the metrics that they get and kind of explains it with percentiles and graphs and tracks it out over time. Uh, and then on the, in, on the internal side, we have all of these dashboards that we can use to try and help, you know, um, find providers that might be particularly good at treating uh, particular problems. But almost all of this was built in R. So if you are a fan of R, uh, pretty much the whole stack uh, uses things like R Studio team. Shout out to R Studio for the team and Connect product. Connect platform has been a game changer for us. We use a lot of R Markdown and parameterize a lot of those reports. Uh, obviously, Shiny and Flex dashboards are also huge and, and tidy versus uh, everyone's bread and butter these days. I'm perfectly on time, which is wonderful. Uh, mental health is a field of opportunity. Um, I think that, you know, on one side, it's obviously sad and it's frustrating to see people uh, find it hard to get access to care, find it hard to actually recover and feel hopeless when they're on that journey. Uh, but, you know, the upside of that or the flip side of that is that there is a lot of opportunity for us to do better. Uh, and so... Um, you know, I encourage anyone if, you know, if they're interested in this space to, to try and see what they can do to help improve mental health care. Uh, but there's lots of technology out there. There's lots of data out there that we can use uh, to help people get better outcomes. Uh, there are lots and lots of places where you can use this. I don't think that it's all about treatment. I think that you can do this kind of stuff in prevention. I think you can do this thing, this kind of uh, framework in marketing. Their mental health is a whole, um, a whole landscape. That, that generally has lacked data historically. And I think there are many places where you can bring data, where you can structure data and where you can use it uh, uh, at the point of operations to, to make better decisions. Uh, and, and it's important to know this is no longer just R&D. This is not just happening in academic settings, it's happening every day, it's happening in the real world, it's happening with real patients like the testimonial that I, uh, that I shared at the beginning. And so, yeah, if anyone's interested in doing this kind of work, we are hiring uh, data scientists uh, at all levels. So we'd love, love to hear from you. And uh, if not, then, you yeah. know, hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much, Adam. I know your talk a few years ago was one of our best received talks. So I was very happy to have you come in here and do this again. And I loved seeing all the R you were using. That was very, very exciting to see. That was super cool. And Adam mentioned he's hiring. 
So if you go to rstats.ai slash job dashboard, you will see they have about five jobs posted right now on the RStats site. 